In today's video, I'm going to take a very comprehensive look at low lighting photography. What is going to impact your ability to shoot in low light from what I'll call hard factors and soft factors to some actual protocols that you can follow as an event photographer, wedding photographer, or any photographer that wants to shoot in low light. So first, let's distinguish between the hard and soft factors. Hard factors, well, that's mostly going to be based off the equipment you have, meaning you can't really change it, at least while you're on the job. Limitations are going to be built into the lenses you use, as well as the camera you use, and I'm going to explore all of those. And then you have your soft factor limitations, your ability as a photographer. Let's talk about camera limitations. The first one we're all familiar with, and I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on that, and that would be your ISO performance. The better the ISO performance, the higher the ISO you can shoot in, uh, but also the better the images will look at those ISOs. So for example, I had the 5D Classic. It was like my second camera I ever used as a professional. And I recall that if I accidentally shot formals at ISO 800, not a very high number by today's standards, I would just kick myself because I knew how terrible they would look relative to ISO 100. But today, shooting at ISO 800 or even 3200 can look amazing. In fact, you can go much higher. And I personally don't even notice grain until, because I don't pixel peep until, I don't know, probably ISO 1600 and higher, something like that. I really don't think much about it. The next thing to discuss would be if your camera has IBIS, in-body image stabilization. Having IBIS means that lenses that don't have IBIS will have some sort of stabilization. And if your lens does have image stabilization, it will work together to give you an even better performance. So Canon, which I happen to use, I think it's something like a um, seven stop improvement with the best combination of like with the right lens, etc. You have to remember that when it comes to stabilization, that has nothing to do with your subject. It's not going to correct for a moving subject. This will work really well if your subject isn't moving and you wanna shoot at maybe even a fifth of a second, you probably can get away with it nowadays. I've done that. Um, I've shot in near darkness by just doing like a fifth of a second, ISO 4000, and held my, you know, held the camera as still as possible and asked my subject not to move. But at most events, for example, you're not able to really do that. So there it will always be a limitation to how slow of a shutter speed you can select. Now the next camera limitation that probably most people aren't really thinking about would be your camera's autofocus abilities. Not just how well the camera autofocuses in broad daylight, but how well the camera can autofocus in low light. And every camera will have a different ability. Um, I'm currently shooting with an R6 and it has an excellent ability to do so. In fact, it can lock onto an eye even when I can barely see the person's eye. But every camera will be a bit different. Of course, all cameras are really great at this now, but it's another thing to keep in mind. Okay, let's talk about lens limitations and how those will impact your low light photography Abilities. So we all know having a large maximum aperture is going to be the most beneficial to you when it comes to the lens that you select for low light photography. If you're having a hard time understanding how aperture works in photography, a great little trick I like to use when I'm teaching my students is to show them with a vintage lens. Older vintage lenses work a bit differently than modern lenses. A modern lens will always have that lens aperture wide open and then stop down right before it takes the photo. However, some of these older vintage lenses, you can actually see the aperture open opening and closing, manually adjusting it. Here you can see me opening and closing my aperture and you can actually see the aperture gets smaller. Smaller means less light passes through, meaning you need longer exposures or a faster film or a higher ISO. When it's wider open, you can shoot with faster shutter speeds because so much light is coming in at any given time. Being able to shoot at 1.2 versus like even 1.8 can have an impact. It's not a huge impact, but if we're talking 1.2 to 2.8, now we're talking about a huge improvement. Now we may be talking about being able to shoot without a flash versus shoot with a flash. And so that has the largest impact, of course, but there are other things to consider. For example, if you have a really long lens, a big telephoto lens, um, this one's not particularly big, but 
it's going to A, be harder to hold steady, but any movement at all will be amplified significantly. So think like if you've ever looked through one of these like quarter operated telescopes and you even breathe on the thing, it starts moving around. Same idea, if you're shooting with a something like this 17 to 40, it's not going to have as big an impact, your personal movement. Um, now, of course, as mentioned before, if the lens has image stabilization, that could be a game changer as well. I would probably prefer to shoot with a 70 to 200 at 200 if it has image stabilization in the lens than maybe like a 135 f2 or maybe even a 2.8 lens that has no stabilization. It's really just going to, to, to depend but in general shooting wider will make shooting in low light a bit easier but that will not trump having just a great maximum aperture. Next I want to talk about variable apertures which I don't have one on me, maybe some old film lenses because they suck and I refuse to shoot with them because I like to shoot in manual or aperture priority and variable aperture lenses, depending on the focal length, the maximum aperture can change. So I'm not a big fan of those um, because you may need to set it to a specific focal length to get the best low light performance and let's move on. They suck. Oh yeah, the closet of shame where variable zoom apertures go to die. So I wanna make one thing clear, and I think it's really important to do so, especially with the YouTube climate as it is, and that is that you do not need a 1.2 lens. I personally have one, it's what's filming right now. I love it. It's been a bit of a game changer. It's allowed me to shoot in ways I could not before. However, you don't have to shoot in that way. It's just an option I now have. I've looked back at a lot of my work recently and some of the low light stuff I did with a 2.8 lens was incredible. And I simply made it work with the flash and that's totally okay. Um, it took me over 10 years, like 11 years to even own, maybe more to own a 1.2 lens. So anyone watching that feels like, oh, I gotta go aperture is everything, I need to buy a 1.2 lens, or if they bought into the bokeh thing, you really don't need it. If I built a career, a successful career, with a great portfolio without one for a very long time, you can too. So to talk about personal skills, which would be a soft skill, something that you can actively work on to improve your low light photography, I'm gonna go outside and I need to move around a bit to demonstrate. Being able to shoot with slow shutter speeds will be impacted by your ability to have a very your ability to shoot in low light will be impacted by how steady you can hold your camera. And how steady you can hold your camera will be impacted by your ability to have a steady stance. It begins with your legs, having a wide enough base and then dropping your weight through your core above your glutes. If you're leaning forward, it's going to be harder to keep your camera steady. And so what you're gonna do is have a wide stance, prop the camera, under your hand under the lens, and you're going to gently press it into your eye. When you're doing that, one other tip that will help you keep it steady is bringing your elbows close to your body, and that will just brace everything together so you can keep your camera steady. If you wanna get down low and get a shot, Going into a deep squat is another way you can keep the camera very steady because you're able to essentially create a tripod by putting your elbows on your knees and then pressing the camera into your face. Another technique I'll use sometimes if I'm tired is I will hug my own camera and brace my hand on my shoulder and then I use that to prop the camera on top of, again, allowing me to shoot at slower shutter speeds. Having a steady breath will mean you'll have a steadier heart rate and it's going to be easier to hold your camera still. Sometimes you need longer shutter speeds than you can comfortably hold, but you really need to get a shot. In those situations, you can press your camera into a wall and thereby stabilizing it. I'll use this technique for establishing shots. It allows me to shoot at a higher f-stop and get more depth, like a large crowd, the entire venue, and that kind of thing. You can get away with shutter speeds for as long as maybe one second or even longer than that if you're able to successfully push the camera into the wall. Another technique I like to use, especially at, let's say, a cocktail hour where there's a lot of little tables, is I will prop my elbows on that table and then stabilize my shot that way. Let's talk about RAW files versus JPEG files. It's not going to be as clear cut as you might think, but if you're thinking RAW files are superior, you're correct because they are. RAW files have more data, meaning you can manipulate the files a lot more. You're able to 
fix an underexposed image or maybe lift shadows a bit, that kind of thing. And of course you are free to apply your own level of noise reduction, which will help with busy images if you busy in noise in regards to noise if you shot at a high ISO. But there are some maybe advantages to JPEG in a way. You may see it this way, and that is that your camera is applying all of those things. Your camera is sorting out what the files should look like for you. Not intelligently, but one thing it will do is apply noise reduction. So maybe if you just want to shoot in low light, but you don't want to deal with reducing the noise yourself, most professionals will always want to choose that option, but maybe you don't for whatever reason, you can shoot in JPEG and the camera will take care of noise reduction for you. Okay, let's talk about when to use flash, which I've talked quite a bit about on my channel. You don't always choose to use flash because you need to, but most of the time we're choosing a flash because we need to use a flash. But here's the thing, sometimes you just want to improve the quality of your light. And this is something I've experimented with a lot this last year. I've been shooting more and more and more with my 51.2 and whenever a able I'm shooting available light. But I always knew there will be a job or two I will eventually run into in which that's a mistake because although I prefer to capture what it was like to be there, sometimes available light is very unflattering. So for example, I photographed an art show and all the lights were these really harsh tungsten lights above. And shooting available gave spotty, harsh light, very tungsteny. It looked terrible. And so I had to make that decision, but I was prepared um, to actually shoot with a higher aperture and a faster shutter and try to cut that light out. I did try balancing at first, it didn't work well. And instead relying on a flash, which worked excellently because there were white walls and white ceilings and I was able to get this beautiful cascading light that was super soft and directional and it worked out better. So sometimes though, I'm choosing a nicer quality of light, but I'm also balancing that, that out with a, a really nice exposure as far as for the ambient light goes. It's not as simple as just dragging the shutter. I've talked a lot about it in other videos and I encourage people to watch those if you haven't already. So a quick thing before I move on to protocols, what I specifically do when I'm shooting in low light and in order, uh, I just wanna address continuous lighting. It doesn't really work so well in a practical sense. It depends on what you're doing. So if you're following my channel, you're probably shooting events. And as an event photographer shooting with a continuous light, uh, I did one time because I, it seemed necessary because a client had asked me to shoot some film. I did so. It was the right type of job to shoot film. And I shot digital, of course, too. But even though I've got the best film camera Canon made, it was struggling to get focus. And so I tried using a continuous light um, and it was just way too bright and distracting. Uh, but shooting with a continuous light for detail shots, that kind of thing can work. And if you're in a pinch, like it's happened where my flash died on me, the batteries were good. I don't know what happened. Uh, I pulled out my cell phone and just used a light to just kick in something um, in order to get just not the worst image. All right, so let's talk about protocols. Let's talk about protocols to follow that will allow you to shoot in low light but also maximize your image quality. The first thing you're going to do is open up your aperture as wide as you can when you're in low light, followed by the longest shutter speed that you personally can get away with and that your equipment can handle, which of course will be influenced by your image stabilization in your lens and your camera body. After we've done that, we can then think about raising the ISO. Now, I believe that it's okay with event photography to shoot at higher ISOs, even 30, above 3200 is totally passable, but we of course want to try to maintain as low an ISO as possible. But don't go so low that you're limiting yourself and you're forcing the camera to shoot with very slow shutter speeds. Sometimes shooting at a higher ISO that gives you more latitude with the shutter speeds you can select or the shutter speeds the camera will select if you're an aperture priority will be worth your while. If the combination of the hard factors and then your soft factors, your ability to maintain a steady camera, etc., have been maxed out, then it's time to start thinking about using a flash. But it's really important that we understand that you shouldn't always use a flash just because you have to. 
Sometimes using a flash will be a better alternative when you have harsh lighting conditions and it might be better to supplement or even overpower those conditions. Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding on how to shoot in low light. I wish you good luck on your next event. Thank you for watching. Cool. And Brixton helped and Willow helped by not sabotaging the whole thing. She's over the trash where she belongs. <laughs>